So welcome to GraphQL Meets Drupal. My name is Sebastian, I always beg you my last name, uh, but you can find me on Twitter under the FUBI and on Drupal.org as simply FUBI. Um, mine's the spelling though, it's B-H-Y and not H-B-Y. Um, before we start, I want to thank a couple of very amazing people that have helped me, inspired me, and supported me during the journey of creating both the PHP library and the Drupal module for GraphQL. And that was uh, Mosh, uh, Preston, Wim, Dries himself, and Acquia for enabling me to work on the module and the library for a considerable amount of time. So thanks to them. Um, they have made this possible for me. What are we going to talk today? Uh, what are we going to talk about today? So um, first of all, we are going to talk about uh, GraphQL in general, the specification, the language, the syntax. We are going to talk about the motivation behind GraphQL and why it even exists. And we are going to talk about Drupal and the status quo of the module uh, in Drupal. And uh, if there's time left, we will talk about some bonus features of GraphQL, which are not yet supported by the Drupal module itself, but uh, are going to be very interesting once they are. All right. So, Whenever you are looking at a new technology that's rising, especially on the web, with the web moving extremely fast in terms of technology in the past years, uh, you have to question yourself and ask whether or uh, if there is any reason for the technology to exist in the first place. And I think that's a very healthy approach towards the technology that we're working with because it's, as I said, very uh, moving very quickly. And um, Obviously, some people at Facebook thought there was a necessity for a new technology for interacting with data from a server. And um, they came up with a very nice solution, and it's called GraphQL. And um, before we start with talking about GraphQL in general, we'll talk about the limitations of REST and what inspired Facebook to create GraphQL. So without any hard feelings about REST, um, obviously it still has its place in the world. Um, there are some fundamental issues, especially with modern web application, that uh, start or are increasingly um, um, working and interacting with a, a huge amount of data. And if, especially if we're talking about client-side applications, that comes at a cost of performance, that comes at a cost of uh, um, uh, usability and uh, developer tooling for the people who are working on these applications. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you have seen this list before, the bullet points on this list. Um, but we are going to talk about why or what, expect, what exactly they mean. So let's look at a, let's look at a very non-hypothetical and real-world example. So we're going to create or hypothetically create a Star Wars API. Um, and uh, we want to fetch some information from a backend, from an API that is a simple REST API, and we want to fetch the full name of one of the characters from, from the movie, or from the special, special movie. We want to fetch uh, the list of other movies that the person appeared in, and we want to also fetch some additional information about the whole homeworld of that character. So if we're talking about traditional REST, this is probably what the response is going to look like. And if you want to try that, um, the API is public. It is a test API for REST interfaces and nicely um, uh, shows some of the core principles of REST. And what you can see here is that we are getting a lot of redundant data, lots of data that we don't require, that didn't want for our, for our application. So instead of just receiving the name and uh, the homeworld name and some of the names of the films that the uh, character appeared in, we are also receiving lots of additional information like the hair color or skin color or eye color, which we couldn't care less about. Um, also, I don't really know how to read the uh, birth date at all, so it's probably also information that we will not need. And that's called overfetching. Um, and this is especially re relevant for Drupal applications because, as we know, Drupal has quite hefty bootstrap. And uh, when we are talking about uh, continuously re uh, requesting API resources from a Drupal backend, that comes at a very, very high performance cost. And this is probably what it's going to look like. So on the left-hand side, that's the API server, and the right, well, that's you. So there's another issue. As we saw, we're not getting the information from the homeworld and from the films that we wanted. We wanted to actually just show the names of those. But instead, we just get a re reference to the resources where we could fetch that, that information. 
And uh, in order to get that information, we'll then have to do another round trip to the server instead uh, of just receiving it directly, where again, we're doing a lot of overfetching and receiving additional information that we didn't want or care about. And these additional round trips, again, come, a lot of, come with a lot of costs for the server because of the uh, bootstrapping that is uh, induced on every single request. And uh, it obviously gets much worse for large lists of things. So as we saw, there's a, there's a couple of films that Luke Skywalker appeared in. So we would have to fetch the whole list of, uh, of, of films separately in order to retrieve the information that we want. And that quickly can get out of hand. So in order to fix this, you might um, take the easy way. Or it might be tempting to uh, try to solve the issue by simply creating um, Band-Aid solutions on your existing API. So one of the Band-Aid solutions that you might think of is creating a custom query parameter that allows you to specify specific fields from um, reference uh, data, from, from uh, data that is associated with the um, uh, data set that you are directly fetching, and uh, it might look like this. Uh, another solution could potentially be to create specific ad hoc resources for each of the views that you want to display on your front-end application. And, um, or it might look like this. And you might think, well, okay, so now I've solved the question, I've solved the problem, let's continue with a different problem. But that's really not how it's gonna work. And some people might be chuckling because uh, you know what's gonna happen if you keep working uh, on this application um, the amount of custom resources that you're going to create over the course of the lifespan of that application is going to increase more and more. And with that comes the high maintainability cost. So yes, you'll end up with lots of, with lots of different resources for specific views. At some point in the life cycle of your application, you might not even know which resources are still in use and which have been used by previous versions of your application. It might be deprecated already, or some might simply break, and because you don't have full test coverage, you will never know. And what's even more scary about this, so far we haven't even talked about API versioning, uh, backwards compatibility. So what happens if um, you want to maintain three different front-end applications, an iOS app, an Android app, a JavaScript application for, for the web. And uh, uh, they all serve, or they all uh, receive data from the same API. They all might need different views, and they all might need uh, different versions of that application. It really comes at a high and exponentially increasing maintainability cost. Also, um, these SQL-esque way of thinking about our data in terms of join tables, you know, chunking the data in, in, into pieces based on the storage model instead of serving it in a way that product developers think about their data, which is graphs. Um, you are really complicating it for the client side developer. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could just tell the server to give us the specific information that we need within a single request um, and ask it to also return that information in the exact shape that we requested it in. And that is indeed possible. So let's actually look at how that would work. So given the same example, we have uh, the person, Luke Skywalker, and uh, he goes by the ID one. We want to fetch his name. And we also want to fetch the, the name of his home world. And also, sure, it's fine. And we also want to fetch the name of each of the firms that he appeared in. And I'm sure you've guessed it by now, but this, what you're looking at here is actually GraphQL. In fact, what you're looking actually is called graphical, which is a fun wordplay on the word GraphQL. Um, uh, it's a nice tool that Facebook developed on top of GraphQL, which leverages the schema definitions from GraphQL to give you um, this nice functional IDE with uh, type aheads and uh, uh, auto-completion for your schema. So let's go back to the slides. That is nice. Everyone's happy. So yes, it's GraphQL. This is the logo of GraphQL. And how does the sorcery work? 
So at its core, GraphQL is just a language specification. Um, it's powered by different implementations in various different languages by now. There's a Ruby implementation, there's even a C uh, parser which you can use with any uh, service that you can imagine. There's uh, a, a, a Sangria, a Scala implementation, there's a PHP implementation which we are using. And there's also um, uh, Rails and uh, Python, JavaScript, anything that you can imagine. Uh, there's probably a library for that already. Um, at its core, it is a data querying language running on arbitrary code, not your storage. It is backed by a schema that you define and is based on a type system that makes it fully introspective. And what that, that exactly means, we'll find out now. So it is very important to know that it's not a query language operating on a graph database. Instead, it runs on arbitrary code, which means it is actually just executing a series of function calls on the server to fetch data based on the graph of your data on the back end. So in the case of Drupal, if you're fetching a node and the node has fields and you want to fetch a specific field from that node, it would basically first fetch the node through the entity API and then in the second, in the second uh, um, uh, series of function calls, it would extract specific fields from that entity and put them all together in a nice JSON structure. It is completely agnostic of, this, of, uh, of your storage layer because of that. And it can therefore potentially run any architecture. Um, you can make it work on your Drupal environment. You can make it work on any other environment. And what's also very important is you can make it work with multiple different remote APIs at the same time. So imagine you have a Drupal backend that also stores user information like Twitter, Twitter account names or Facebook account names in the user profile. And you want to query both Facebook and Twitter when fetching information about the user, you could do that in the same schema. You could tell uh, Drupal to retrieve that information on the back end and spit it out to you when you're requesting information about the user on your front end application through the same resource. And that's very powerful. So I really like this slide and I've been copying it from one slide deck to the next since I've been talking about GraphQL because it really gives uh, give, uh, communicates a very important message about GraphQL, and that is it evolves and changes the client-server side relationship. So instead of the server dictating the response structure and also what it returns, and uh, the client having to work with what it gets, uh, the server now publishes its possibilities and the client um, specifies its requirements. Um, this also shifts some of the responsibility from the server to the client, well, now the client is capable of telling the server exactly what it needs, and there's no chance of um, any of the client-side applications breaking unless you change the schema on the server, which you should. So there's a couple of resources for learning GraphQL and the syntax. We'll work uh, ourselves through the syntax together here, but if you're further interested in GraphQL after this presentation, there's three very important and nice um, interactive solutions, well, two of them are interactive, one is for the brave, uh, for learning GraphQL. So we have the Star Wars API that I just demoed, it's the first resource. Then for people who are more interested in a guided tour through the GraphQL syntax, there's also a learning series, which is also very interactive and allows you to execute GraphQL queries yourself. And for the brave, there's the actual text form RFC specification written by uh, Facebook, and it's one of the best RFCs I've ever, ever read, but it's still an RFC, so it's very hard to grasp. So. And if you're writing your own GraphQL parser, that's the last resource is probably where you start, but if you're just interested in the syntax, go for one of the first two, okay? <laughs> so the features of GraphQL are manifold, and uh, first of all, for entering um, one of the uh, for, for querying data or for mutating data or for um, subscribing to data through WebSockets, um, obviously you have queries, mutations, and subscriptions. But then when you're descending in the object graph, uh, in your data graph, to fetch inf information about specific uh, objects from your backend, uh, we, are, we, are, we have the ability to use aliasing, fragments, directives, variables, arguments, and subselections. And you probably have no clue what that means, but we will look at that now and it's really, really powerful. So let's see the next one. 
So far, we have only worked with the Hello World example of GraphQL, really, simply executing a very simple object selection and then fetching subfields from that. Um, but we can do much more. So let's begin with a little bit more complex example. Let's fetch all of the films that have ever been, all of the Star Wars films that have ever been uh, um, produced. And from all of these films, we want to fetch the title. We want to fetch, well, maybe the director, a list of producers, and we can also descend in the object graph by fetching related data models. So, for example, we can fetch all of the species that appeared in that specific film. And we will then return that information for all of the items returned by the species connection. So if we do that, we see that in the movie A New Hope, we had humans, droids, Wookiees, something else. All we can now do is we can tell it to only give us the first two. And now it becomes apparent that what we're actually dealing with here is remote function calls. Because each field in the schema is powered or backed by a resolver function in your schema. And that makes it so that we can provide arguments to those. And those arguments are then uh, also passed to the function which powers the schema entry point on the back end. And that works on every level. So also here, I can say, give me only the first two. And that's what I meant by saying it is run on arbitrary code opposed to directly querying the database. Um, we have function calls, and that is very powerful because that comes with all of the flexibility that you can imagine, and it means that it can run on any backend that you can imagine. So now that we have um, the possibility to fetch a list of films, there's also another feature that is very powerful. We can fetch the ID of an object. And if you've worked with the Facebook Graph API before, don't confuse that with the GraphQL API, but if you've worked with the Facebook Graph API, you will know that they have um, generic objects which are identified by a, gen by a universal ID that you can use to fetch that object without knowing what that object actually is. And this is also the case here. So every GraphQL schema um, dictates that you should expose an ID field, and this is actually just a base64 encoded string containing the original ID of the object and the type of the object. So what we can do now is, given this ID here, we can query the generic node entry point and say, OK, give me this object. And because we don't know what type of object this is at this point, all we can do is we can fetch the ID again, but we can also fetch the name of the type. We'll get back to this because this is a feature of introspection. We'll talk about that later. But now, because we know, hey, this object can potentially be a film, we can use fragments. And fragments define that if the object returned by this call is actually a film, now I'm basically type hinting again, give me the title. And then, because we now know it's going to be a film, we can alias that response. and tell it, well, you are a firm, so make your JSON array key a firm. And if we fetch a list of people, this, comes, this, this is starting to become useful. Because now, oops, sorry. We can start to use variables So given the query of name my query, using a variable named ID, which is of type string in this case, and if we then pass that variable here, 
sorry, it has to be ID. We now know the ID that we have been passing down here is actually a person now, not a firm anymore. So if we specify, hey, you're a person, give me the name, that works. And why is this so important? Well, variables and fragments are as essential to GraphQL as the querying itself, because if you're talking about an application of the size of Facebook, the news feed on the front page would take thousands of lines of querying code in order, to man or in order to be able to fetch all the details and information that it requires to render that nicely structured uh, hierarchical list of, of data in your, in your news feed. And Graf uh, Facebook came up with the idea of instead of sending the query every time the whole huge string, which could be a couple of kilobytes large, to the server, they would store this, the query string on the server, um, exposing it as a route, and only accepting the query ID, uh, the query parameters for the route, which would then call the stored and poss possibly obfuscated query to return the data that you were originally uh, yeah, uh, fetching or trying to fetch in your front-end application. And this is very handy if you're talking about um, large client-side applications where the string can't be obfuscated in your JavaScript, for example. Um, so you could add a build task to your tooling chain and make it so that on the backend in Drupal, it would generate routes where you would simply expose um, uh, the query parameters and generate a query from that. Right. So we have heard the, the, the name schema a couple of times now. Um, fundamentally, each schema is simply an arbitrary nested hierarchy of, ty of type definitions. And those type definitions are powered by a very powerful type system uh, utilizing scalars, so simple primitives like string, integer, etc., as well as enums for fixed lists of things, for example, a list of image formatters for your Drupal file system, or a list of text formatters for your text fields. Um, additionally, we have objects, objects being complex types, like entity node or entity uh, user. And we have interfaces that combine these in case there's multiple sub uh, definitions of those types. So if we're talking about nodes in Drupal, we will have articles, we will have pages, and they all might have different fields. And we're talking about unions. Unions, unions are simply um, combina combinations of multiple objects that are all valid inside of a given context. So this is some pseudocode trying to explain how these type definitions are put together. Um, so if we're talking about Drupal again, we will have an interface of type entity node, which combines both types, entity node article and entity node page, both implementing entity node in this case. And the interface exposes all of the common fields like title, UID, uh, the created and updated timestamps, and the node ID itself. And what's, Im what's important here is that all of these fields can again be complex types. And that's what I meant with arbitrarily nested hierarchy. You can make your schema as complex as you need it to be. So in this case, UID would be an entity reference field targeting the entity of type user. And thereby, if you are following that reference, it would first give you um, A, the ID of the user, and B, the full entity object allowing you to fetch the name the email address and other information from that user. So we've spoken about resolver functions before and how um, Drupal or any GraphQL schema implementation invokes uh, these resolver functions to fetch the nested data. Um, so in, type, in terms of the entity node article type, we'll have the title field and the image field, as you can see here and other fields, obviously. And 
this simply illustrates that a resolver function receives the parent node from the graph hierarchy as an argument to the function, as well as potentially any number of additional arguments that you specify in your schema. So for example, if you want to fetch an image, you might want to also specify what type of image formatter you want to apply to that image before you get the URL to that image in return. So yeah, if you want to fetch the title, it will simply give you the title property from the entity object. Um, and if you wanted to fetch the image, it would also uh, expose uh, the potentially available formatters as an enum, which you can then provide in your schema, uh, in, your, in your graph uh, uh, query. And it will then, then be respected in your resolver function and uh, received as an argument. You can see that right here. This is pseudocode, right? This is not PHP. Just say. Introspection. This is one of the most interesting features of GraphQL. So when you're working with traditional REST APIs, you often have to document the API yourself. Um, there's no formal specification of what REST can and can't do, and there's no formal specification or standard uh, for all of the REST APIs in the world, because really everyone defines REST in a different way. Um, for you to generate the definitions and the descriptions and the whole set of available information that you can potentially retrieve from your server. Introspection is the way for GraphQL to generate additional schema information for your schema. If you remember the movie Inception, um, this is kind of the same thing really, because you are inside of your schema in GraphQL and Drupal, you're defining your schema for all of your Drupal data types, and then GraphQL takes care of defining additional information inside of your schema, exposing that information. And this is so interesting and so powerful because it allows you to build tooling around your GraphQL implementation. So we have looked at the GraphQL interface before. And the only way it can work is because it retrieves information about all of the available types from your schema. Every GraphQL server exposes specific and special underscore prefixed schema entry points that allow you to descend in the object graph, fetching information about the type of the objects, all of their children, descriptions, fields that they host, etc., arguments. And when you execute the query, you get a whole, range, a whole um, range of information back from the server that is very useful for your front-end tooling, in this case, for example, for graphical. This is how this IDE works. And it's also useful for it to generate documentation that you can simply browse on the site. So GraphQL is, simply, is more than just a query language. It's actually a whole ecosystem of tooling and things that Facebook has already vouched to create. I'm really looking forward to seeing more from them. Building a GraphQL server, however, is much simpler than you would expect. First of all, at the very top of your, uh, of your, of your server, you have the GraphQL library that supports parsing, tokenizing, and parsing the GraphQL query string, and then turning it into function calls, a series of function calls which simply operate on the application code and then can retrieve information from any source that you can imagine. In terms of Drupal, this is a DrupalCon, so we have to talk about Drupal, obviously. Um, we have created a module over the past month that does exactly what we have been talking about this whole presentation. We are generating a schema based on the available information that Drupal already exposes from its core. And we are then adding resolver functions which operate on our application layer, on our APIs, the entity API, the entity query API, to fetch nodes, users, and any arbitrary uh, entity, constant entity at this point, um, that you might create in the lifetime of your Drupal site. So the goal was to not have you create your schema manually through custom code, but instead generate the schema for you based on your fields, your entity fields, your bundle fields, 
and all of the properties hosted by your entity types. We wanted to also make it possible for you to leverage not only single loading of entities by their ID, but also batch loading through the entity query API, exposing all of the query fields, not only for fetching the data, but also for providing arguments to the query API. And as a, fun, as a foundation for that schema to operate and for that schema, for, for us to generate that schema, we have, a, we have a really good foundation for that in core already, in Drupal 8 at least, and that's the type data API. So essentially, all that the module does is translating already existing type data API type definitions into a structure that the GraphQL um, uh, library can understand. So the initial version of that module has been released uh, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, I think. Um, it, supports, it supports all of these basic initial goals that I just outlined. We've got support for um, uh, single loading of entities. We've got support for multi-loading of entities, batch loading of entities through the Entity Query API. And uh, we have support for filtering. There's views integration, so you can provide custom entry points to your schema. Um, I'll show both of that stuff in, in a minute. And uh, we have also made sure that uh, access checks are built in, because that was the most fundamental thing, obviously, to finish after we have done the initial loading. Um, there's some limitations, though. Uh, ideally, to complement the uh, GraphQL uh, ecosystem, we would also be fully compliant with the relay specification. I'm not going to go into detail about relay here, but um, uh, if you're working with React, you're probably familiar with relay. We are currently not compliant to the relay specification, so you can't use it with that yet. That is one of our next goals. We will also add mutation support, which is currently not supported, so writing on the server. Um, and we're also going to uh, add means for you to customize your exposed schema so that you don't expose entity types that you are not considering fetching from at all. Um, we will add config entity support uh, through the configuration schema, which is also available. Um, and in general, uh, generally try to uh, make it very, very useful without having to specify custom views, because right now pagination is um, not ideal, and you would have to create custom views for that, but let's look at that. So now we are looking at an actual Drupal site. Um, let me increase the size of that again. We have got two Drupal node types, article and basic page, and we have got some content for both of those types. And we have got the graphical interface, which you just saw for the Star Wars API, built into Drupal itself. So under GraphQL Explorer, you can directly reach that. If you install the module, you already have that. And it allows us now to load entities directly through their ID. Sorry. So if I go into node ID 1, I can now fetch the node ID again. Obviously, I have that already title, and here's our entity. We have looked at the type system before, so the body field is not available on all nodes by definition. It's a field. So we will use fragments to say, in case this is a t of type entity node article, also give me the body field. And from that body field, I only want the actual value not the summary or anything, just the actual HTML output that was written into the body field. We can also create new fields because it uses the type data API, and as long as your field definition has a type data uh, integration, which it has by default, there's no way you can't do that, it will also directly be supported. So the moment that I save this field on the node type, uh, let's just make it a plain text field. Save it. 
go into my node and write some text into this field. Oh, I didn't save it right, did I? Sorry. Go back into the node. <clears throat> now this is the page. And now because the schema is automatically generated, we now have up, let me reload. Obviously, the IDE has to fetch that information from the server first, so I have to reload the interface. And the Wi-Fi is really bad here. So. One second, I need to reconnect. Fetching the JavaScript for the graphical interface from the server, uh, from, from a remote uh, CDN. Um, and it's failing to do that. Oh, no, it's fine. So now there's our other text field now. And if I fetch that for another E1, is it one? It was node ID three. Oops. It's there. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, there's also the possibility for you to fetch lists of nodes. So right now, or before we fetch the specific node by ID, we can also fetch all of the nodes using the Entity Query API, fetching the title for each of them. Or we can say, limit the result set based on the available queryable fields exposed or by the Entity Query API. So in this case, for example, I only want to fetch Articles, uh, nodes of type article. That works. Or page. And that works as well. I didn't try it before, so I'm also really excited. <laughs> so, fragments. When fetching all of the nodes of all of the types that, have, that we have available, we also obviously have access to both of these fragments. So if it's a node of type page, fetch the body. If it's a node of type article, fetch this additional text field. We can also fetch stuff nested in the object graph. So if we want to get information about the author of that node, for example, the name, we can simply descend further in the object graph through fetching uh, the user object via the UID property on each of the nodes. We can then further head into the actual entity object and pick out fields from the return entity. This is an entity reference field. So it has, has two values in the field type definition. First of all, the target ID, which is the ID of the entity object. And additionally, it exposes an entity property. Um, as you might know, if you're creating custom field types for your uh, Drupal site, you can specify multiple properties for your field types. 
and in case of an entity reference field, that's, that's the two fields that are available. So even if your custom field has multiple different properties, they are also supported directly. And we have built in some um, neat simplifications for the schema, because normally all of the field types that you have would be exposed as a list, because type data simply makes every field in your Drupal environment a list. Otherwise, multiple, uh, multi um, cardinality fields wouldn't work nicely through the API. Um, we are checking if the field is actually a single value field or if it has multiple deltas. If it does have multiple deltas, we are exposing it as a list. If it doesn't, we are simply exposing it as a single end item. Furthermore, if the field has multiple properties, we are exposing it as an object with fields as subselections, so you can uh, filter out the specific properties that you want from the field type. However, if it is um, a plain a value with a single, uh, a plain field with a single property, we are directly exposing that. And that makes it possible for you to directly fetch the title without having to define any, any special subselections. Right. Do you want to see any more? Hmm? Right. Uh, the question was if I talked about permissions. I did talk about permissions. Um, so we have um, entity uh, level access checks and field level access checks built in. So in general, if the item that is returned from the API is of type accessible, so there's an interface in Drupal called accessible interface, if it, if it implements that, we are checking for access. So as we, as we uh, talked, there are some limitations currently. We don't have relay support, we don't have mutation support, and we don't have config entity support. We are going to add that. Um, I'm already working on the second version. Some of these things are currently limited by the fact that the GraphQL PHP library is a little bit um, behind in terms of feature parity with the actual JavaScript, the original JavaScript implementation. And that's because they are moving very quickly and I'm working on it alone. So I would appreciate if some people could assist me in working on the module. I'm, I'm really looking for help. Um, both for organizing contribution on the module as well as simply writing code. Um, and uh, because we have some time left uh, before we do questions, so I'll say we have five more minutes before we do questions, I, I want to show some additional features that I'm going to implement um, for the module that I'm looking into implementing. And the first very interesting is pagination. And pagination in GraphQL together with Relay, and that's the key here, GraphQL and Relay together make a very nice combination for pagination, um, is very amazing. So again, if you want to fetch a list of films, you go through the all films um, root call, and you can then fetch information about the pagination. So does it have a next page? Does it have a previous page? What is the end? What is the identifier inside of my list for the first item? And what is the identifier inside of that list for the last item? Um, why that is useful, I'll show you in a bit. So now we can go in and fetch specific <coughs> items and tell me, say, okay, let's fetch the title of each of those. And there's also another interesting property on here, which is called cursor. And cursor is the identifier of a specific item inside of the context of a given list. That means if you are sorting a list by a specific property, the cursor will be different than if you sort it by a different property. And it is basically a base64 encoder string as well, com com combining the type of the object, the ID of the object, and the way it was sorted. And that's very simple and also very clever because what it allows you to do, what it allows you to do is if we are limiting the response set to two items, and now it tells us, well, there's a next page. And this is the cursor of the first item in that result set. This is the cursor of the last item in the response set. And they match up with these here. So what I can do now, and this is so exciting, I can tell it, okay, well, give me the first two after this cursor. and gives me the next two. And I can continue for the next two after this cursor. And that is just, it just feels much more natural when pagination through a result set than 
when you have to do page one, page two, page three, because it's just, it limits the result set by a range plus a starting point and potentially an end point. You can also do it in the reverse order. So you can say, okay, give me the first two before this one. It just works naturally. And this information is also really nice if you want to make a, a forward and backward button. All right. Mutations, for that we'll have to wait a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you together on that. So if you're willing to volunteer and work on the graph camera, please get in touch after the session. And I'll also try to arrange above tomorrow. So is, are there any questions? Right, um, if you have any questions, please find the microphone here in the middle of the room. This looks fantastic. It addresses every qualm that I've had with REST. Uh, and second, I want to ask, uh, this seems to only deal with querying. What about insert and update? Right. That's what we call mutations. And so I've spoken about mutations. Um, I should have made it clearer, I guess, that it's mutations are updating and creating content uh, or configuration for that matter. Um, so yes, mutations are going to be uh, one of the next two things that we are working on. So first will be relay, second will be mutations. Um, if you're interested in mutations, we can talk about that during the buff. Um, the way it's working in GraphQL is basically, you also have a function call which receives an input object, which is the stuff that you want to write to your backend. And then as the subselection, as the fields that you can fetch in return to your mutation, you simply get the object as a context that you just created. So what you can do if you create a node, you basically invoke the function called create node, giving it a set of information for the, for the node that you're want, wanting to create. And then in return, you can fetch the ID of the node that has just been created. Um, that's also very powerful. And uh, it allows you to, for example, directly then, in return to creating the node, fetching the name of the author, for instance. So, um, but if you're, more, if you're further interested in that, uh, I'll, I'll definitely speak about the uh, new features in the buff tomorrow. Thank you. Um, if I've got a front, uh, front end app with Angular or React Redux app, what does my endpoint look like to be able to access this information from uh, to be able to get this stuff out of Drupal? Right, so that uh, first depends on whether or not you're using Relay. So when you're using Relay, you uh, really has this nice way of injecting a network layer so you don't have to worry about fetching or requesting the data yourself at all. So you simply uh, tell Relay, okay, so this is your URL to, uh, this is the HTTP URL to my server and then you're done. However, if you are uh, directly um, putting together your, the queries yourself and using simple REST, uh, simple, uh, sorry, simple HTTP calls to fetch or to, to send the query to the server and then working with the response, you have to deal with, your, with it yourself, and you just have to put together the base path of the GraphQL server, so HTTP your Drupal environment .com slash GraphQL. So GraphQL is the endpoint in, inside of the GraphQL site. And then you put the query that you want to send either in the get parameter query or inside of the post body uh, on the query. And then there you can also specify a variables post field. Um, real quick. Uh, what that the, the MySQL, the MariaDB backend of Drupal slows this down or, or uh, does it scale up? Do you see uh, with anything you've been able to test? Right, so there's one small issue with nested data structures. So if you're accessing the second dimension basically inside of your GraphQL query, um, right now I'm not optimizing the query so that it does multi-loading of entities for that case. For the first layer, yes, not for the second one. Um, so if you're fetching a node and then users and then something else inside of the user, like another reference, that's not optimized for. Um, but we're working on that as well. So basically prefetching stuff and then. This is really cool. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just have a quick question. How does the security training work here? So if I have a user that I want to have, like this specific user only have access to a certain number of nodes that 
either he created or he has access to. So how does that work with the endpoint? You're talking about the exposing of the full schema of the site, or you're talking about exp exp explicitly exposing data? Exposing part of the data. All right. So um, the GraphQL schema on the server side, the resolver functions, all have to deal with access checks and permission checks themselves. Um, but since we are generating the schema for both entities and their fields, and both of these items can potentially have access restrictions on them, and we, we are aware of that. So both of them implement the PHP interface accessible interface. And if they do, we simply call arrow access with the current user that's currently authenticated. And if the user doesn't have access to the node, we don't fail the entire query, or we don't let them access that subset of the query. Thanks. What does this look like in, uh, in the context of uh, a decoupled application or uh, a facade in front of many backend data source? You know, so you want api.example.com, single endpoint, and you've got licensing information, three different systems, maybe two or Drupal websites, two or something else. You wouldn't have that. You couldn't have that. Well, you, you could, but you wouldn't want to. So the idea is that if you want to interact with many different APIs, you would put a GraphQL middleware that actually deals with these APIs through the schema so that you can abstract the interaction with the other remote APIs within your server schema. So you call that one GraphQL entry point, that single source of truth, basically, and you'll handle the remote API calls within your server structure and then basically returning the entire accumulated result set in one go. Um, and that one probably needs to provide the data storage. What do you mean? Which? So if you're calling one endpoint, so what I think of as like the, fa the facade, uh, that needs to provide the GraphQL logic. And right, the, right. And probably so, the data storage, it would be too heavy for it to be uh, interactive. Yeah, so basically you're asking me, how do you upgrade to GraphQL? Sure. Right. So um, this is a really interesting question, and people have tried this. Actually, the Star Wars GraphQL API that you saw there is running on the REST API and simply forwarding calls uh, through the schema. So when we, and when we try to fetch, and you can download the GraphQL Star Wars API implementation to see that happen, and you see, that in the, you see it in the console output in the terminal when you're running it. Um, you execute the query fetching all of the films, and it, in the back, in the, in the, in the, on the server, it then hits the REST API, fetches the information, fetches the information from there, caches it, and gives you what you need from that. Um, so the first step to upgrading your existing implementation, if you're not using Drupal, because then you generate the schema for you anyways, but if you are talking about an existing application, Drupal 7 or whatever, you can definitely expose REST resources from your Drupal backend, and then in the middle you put a Node.js server that's simply where you would write the GraphQL schema in Node and have it call the REST resources of your Drupal site. That is possible, and that's actually what Facebook recommends. You're welcome. Hi, uh, Chris Weber, software engineer from the Nerdery. You're last in line, so I hope you don't mind. I got two questions. Yeah. Um, uh, a question that I have uh, reported to me is that when, when we, we have GraphQL and we're using GraphQL on a Drupal site, does this mean that we have to manage schema in two different locations? Manage the schema with inside the Drupal site and manage the definition and manipulations of the schema with the GraphQL. Am I getting that wrong? Uh, you don't have to manage the GraphQL schema yourself because we are generating it for you on the server completely. So we have the type data API in Drupal, and if you are creating custom entity types, you are always defining the type data definitions for them. Okay. Um, the core type data, uh, the core entity types are already fully defined, and they have the properties fully defined, and all of the field types are also defined through type data. So we are just traversing on that on those type type definitions. And why we do so, we're translating them into GraphQL schema definitions. Okay. Um, that means that as soon as you're starting to site build your environment, all of the stuff, all of the stuff, all of the fields that you configure will be available through the GraphQL directly. You don't have to worry about that. If, okay. however, you want to create custom resources, you can do that. Um, the way that it works is currently tagged services, so you can create a custom service in, in Drupal 8. 
which, for example, calls Facebook API or Twitter API or does some other stuff, like calculating the time, on, time and date uh, at a certain location in the world. Um, you, it's, you're completely free to expose any additional information that you want through a custom service that attaches another graph schema or sub, sub schema to your whole. Cool. Uh, thanks. You just want to bet for me. Um, uh, the other question is, um, it sounds like this is a, an awesome thing to be added to the Drupal platform, but I wonder, is there anything that could be changed in the Drupal platform, for example, the type data API, in order to better adapt, better work with GraphQL, from your perspective? Right. Um, so we had to do some workarounds, well, not workarounds. We had to do some simplifications for it to actually work nicely, right? Um, so type data is very verbose. It makes every field a list, uh, regardless of it being a single data field or a multi-data field. So that's something that was very annoying. Um, so we can't just iterate on the type data API without uh, making some assumptions about it. So for example, while we were translating the GraphQL schema, we had to check, hey, does this field have multiple sub-properties or not? Well, it's not a, not a card anymore. Um, and uh, if it doesn't have many multiple sub-properties, we make it directly accessible without you having to specify another sub-selection, right? Like, so you don't have to go title, uh, first item, value. You just write title and you get the title directly inside of the JSON response. Um, if we had simply used GraphQL directly, uh, type data API directly, it would be so that you'd have, if you, if you have an entity and you wanted to fetch only the title, you'd have to go, uh, node one, title, zero, value. So that's the verbosity coming from the type data API, and we had to work around that. Um, it would definitely be easier for us if type data would re uh, work the way we are doing right now uh, itself, but it doesn't, and there's good reasons for that. So I'm not sure. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, it's not actually coffee time, but I wanted to include this GIF. <laughs> right, there's a couple of resources. I just put the slide up here so that's being recorded. Um, there's a working draft, the RFC. Uh, there's a reference implementation in JavaScript, which is the most up-to-date version. Actually, not true. The Sangria guy, the, scale, the guy that is working on the Scala implementation, is uh, sometimes the head of the actual Facebook developers yeah. because he's crazy, I don't know. And uh, there's a graphical um, uh, source code as well on GitHub. We have the Star Wars API playground on GitHub. You can check out how the schema is built uh, by checking out that source code. We have the relay GraphQL specification, um, you know, the stuff with the pagination and cursors and so on. Um, so that's what we are going to work on. There's the learn, learn GraphQL tutorial, step by step. And the GraphQL relay and Drupal demo repository so once we have relay support, this repository is going to host, or it's actually already hosting a React relay application, uh, also using Redux, um, um, that is, has a lot of cool stuff in it. Like it has server-side rendering. Um, it, well, it has relay, so it's directly com connecting to a GraphQL server. It has uh, Google accelerated mobile pages built in. It has um, uh, service workers built in, so all of the cool new stuff, all of the fancy things that we are currently talking about uh, on the web, um, they are already in there. And the only thing that's missing now is the server-side implementation support for Relay. And once we have that, you can use that as a starting point for your client-side completely decoupled applications. Um, and if you want to try it out already, and just to check out the service workers and uh, offline support and all these stuff, uh, all these things, you can do it. It is currently working on the Star Wars API. Um, Let's go back to this slide. All right. Thanks for listening. And <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks, man. That was awesome. I was I was on the Wi-Fi before. It wasn't. It didn't work. I was wrong. Huh? I'm so sorry, I'm looking for work. Uh, so, uh, thanks for coming out.
Yes. I don't need JavaScript, I need PHP. Okay, nice. I believe I would need a lot of work actually to be done for that because. So is it, is it okay if I can show you the card? Sure. Um, I'm really new at Amazing Labs, so I don't have a card yet. I would give you mine, but if you give me yours, I can send you a message. You also want to get contacted? Okay, thanks. Uh, this is what I wanted. This is why I had the presentation. Thanks. Awesome. You too? Yeah, uh, me too. Me too. All right, I'll tweet all of you as well for the mop off tomorrow, right? I'll try to schedule it now. Great. I don't know when it is going to be, but I'll let you know. Uh, I want to follow up with you about two things. Um, so I think the Node.js thing you're talking about is exactly what I need. Right. I missed the first like 15 minutes. I, okay. I think I missed some of what you're referencing. Right. I just want to make sure I know what to look up. So this idea of if the endpoint hits Node.js and then Node.js does has this schema or does, has the logic and it's hitting potentially a constellation of RESTful APIs. Yeah. Right. So back end. So yeah. I look up to like see who said Facebook recommends that. Um, well, that's basically so. There was a presentation in London by Nick Schrock, one of the developers of uh, GraphQL, and uh, uh, the same question came up, how do I migrate to, to GraphQL? And, um, the problem that guy had who asked the question was, he was working on a very big team where backend and frontend developers were mostly separated, and there was a gigantic team and a uh, gigantic application. And uh, also, some of the uh, some of the DevOps engineers they were a little bit concerned about GraphQL security implication, implications, etc. So they didn't want to jump on the fancy train, right, to directly use GraphQL. So he suggested, hey, why don't you write a JavaScript implementation calling your existing REST APIs um, as a proof of concept, right? So you can already use GraphQL and Relay in the front end. And then when they are ready and when they see that how how cool it is and they want to migrate, they can write and move the schema from that middleware JavaScript Node.js impl impl uh, implementation into the actual backend, right? And even if then you have to have additional REST services uh, that you want to call, like Facebook, Twitter, right. Google, whatever, right. you can also move that from the middleware to the server, sure. unless authentication for that happens on the front end, obviously. Right. Um, but there's other people doing extremely crazy stuff, like you could also use GraphQL on the client to query your local storage. Um, so like have Relay query the client instead of so basically not doing any server-side communication at all and just using it inside of that client application or for PouchDB, offline support, whatever. It's yeah. completely up to you. Okay. So you said London? Uh, Nick, Schrock. Nick Schrock. Yeah, great guy. Okay. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him there. Was, no, it was, was not uh, DrupalCon. It was uh, in the Facebook headquarters. It's called well, just Google Nick Schrock London React Meetup or something. React, okay. Yeah. So other thought for you. So I work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh -huh. Massachusetts. Um, we're about to start doing micro-purchasing experiments, like 18F, I don't know if you follow those at all. No. The idea is basically we can skip the procurement process, the yeah. government procurement process, for anything that's less than $10,000. Okay. So the idea is to basically open up our backlog and try to hire people to work on tickets, ticket by ticket, not, not contract So you're crowdsourcing your workforce. That's right. So you can sell you $100,000 worth just have to do 10 tickets. Right. So I, I wrote a bit.ly URL on the card there, bit.ly slash Drupal micro. Do you have GraphQL tickets? Well, so <laughs> we're talking about how to build out api.mass.gov, which would be right. the facade in front of all of the publicly available data in the state of Massachusetts. So that's where you're coming from. That's right. Oh. So, and I, I don't think there's any future where we're actually going to centralize it all in a single GraphQL application. Yeah. But this idea, I mean, we're already talking about doing this with REST, like, there's a facade layer that talks all these legacy yeah. backends that provide the REST API. Mm -hmm. you know, because it doesn't make a difference, right? I mean, you're doing the REST calls either way. Either you're doing it directly or you're doing it on the server. And right. the benefit is if you're doing it on the server, you can potentially do it in the same